Today we come to the <clears throat> close of the series, The Definition of Me. <clears throat> now you know that I'm not talking about just me, I'm talking about me, all of us. And it seems that in today's twisted grammar, uh, pardon me for saying this, but uh, today's twisted grammar, we have gotten gra very great attention on me. So that we say, me and my wife are going to New Hope today. No! First thing, that's the wrong pronoun. Second thing is, you don't say me first, you say the other person first. But, okay, my little protest about today's society. Don't do that. Uh, it does point out a bit, though, how important me is to us. The definition of me. Who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? The great questions that face all of us. And today we come to the last of this series, The Man Overboard. Peter, The Man Overboard. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to trace through uh, a whole list of events of Peter's life where he relates to the Lord. And uh, there are so many of them that I'm not going to be able to take time to read the scriptures. You know the stories. We're just going to touch them and then come to the end. Because the big question that we're asking today <clears throat> in the definition of me, the man overboard, am I just a victim of my genetic inheritance? Am I just a victim of the environment in which I find myself? Do I make the excuse, well, I was just born this way, you know, you, you're going to have to deal with me. This is just the way I am. Which is often just an excuse for obnoxiousness. Am I stuck with that? What is the definition of me, the man overboard? But before I do that, I, I want to do one more thing. <clears throat> I want to make a special introduction to someone who is a very dear friend of mine. David and Lynn Steen are here today. Now, you don't know that name probably, but David and Lynn came as teachers at Southern Adventist University back when it was Southern Missionary College. And I was a young pastor at the College Dale Church. Uh, went there when I was 33. And David, I think you were about 28 or 29 when you came there. Uh, we didn't realize we were young. But the reason I mention this is because something very special my wife and I have been doing mornings for breakfast this year and that is reading David's devotional book. I don't know if you have come across this book, but we have a dignitary with us today. David, stand up, just so they can see who you are. Welcome to New Hope. And uh, <laughs> David has written the devotional book, and he is just days away from his retirement in the biology department at Andrews University, and this devotional book, in my humble opinion, is the best one we've had that I can remember. Uh, and it is drawn out of the experience of his vast knowledge of biology uh, and his own personal experience from daily life. So it's just like breakfast with David and Lynn every morning for us. And I want to encourage the rest. Have some of you been reading this? Uh, if you don't have it, get to the ABC and buy it. Uh, and if you start, well, this is the 1st of June, six months left in the year. If you read two a morning, uh, you'll be done with it at the end of the year. It's that good. You want to do it. David, I'm sorry. I just had to do that. Uh, it is just so outstanding that I wanted to share it with all of you and let you know that we have a special guest with us here today. Uh, and uh, just days since you retired, and uh, David Newman and I were just talking with him, and David and... I were telling him, retirement's the best job we ever had. <laughs> so, glad to have you with us today, and I wanted to share that with everybody so you could enjoy uh, breakfast with David and Lynn in the mornings. Man overboard. Overboard 
is a term that we still use, but we don't really understand it in the context that it was originally. We you know we say, well, he really went overboard. This came from the old days of the uh, big multi-masted uh, sailing vehicles. And the point was this. When you are on one of these big four or five masters sailing across the ocean and you fall overboard, what you need to do is wave goodbye. Because they ain't coming back. Man overboard. And if anybody happened to see it in time and could get to the back of the boat and throw off a life ring, maybe you had a chance, but otherwise, forget it. Uh, it's even true with the big ships these days, although they do have power and they have small boats on there that are power boats, and maybe you stand a chance. And just to give you an example of this, a few years ago, my wife and I were making the journey across the waters of the Puget Sound towards Seattle, something that I used to do as a little kid rather often. There were not as many bridges and ways to cross that waterway in those days. You had to take the ferry. We lived in Bremerton. You had to take the ferry from Bremerton to Seattle. Either that or you had to go way, way, way down south as far as Olympia and back up several hours' drive to get to Seattle because the Tacoma Narrows Bridge had blown down in a windstorm. So we took the ferry to Seattle. It was a lot of fun taking the ferry. I always enjoyed it. And so my wife and I, on a little vacation a few years ago, were taking a ferry across to Seattle. I always like to stand at the back of the boat, and on those boats it's hard to tell which is the front and the back because they go both directions. But the back was where the cars came on, where we were hooked up to the island. And we were going across, and I like to stand there and watch the boat go out of the dock. That was a favorite experience of mine. And as I was standing there, the captain of the ship came up to me, and he said, I want you to help us with something. I said, what? Me? I want you to help us. And he handed me a life-saving ring, kind that you throw to someone. He handed it to me. He said, we're going to go out of the dock. And he says, we, we do this drill every now and then to, uh, just to see what it takes. He said, when we get about five or ten minutes out, whenever you feel like it, you throw that ring overboard. And we will start the timer when you throw that overboard and see how long it takes to stop the ferry, get out the power boat, turn it around, and head back to the boy in the water. Well, I thought this was rather interesting that I should be selected to do such a significant event as this. So. I held it there, and I suppose we stood there seven or eight minutes, and then just suddenly I threw it overboard. All kinds of amazing things began happening. There were whistles and bells going off, the huge brrrm horn overhead, just all kinds of things happening, shuddering this big boat to a stop. And I looked over the edge, and they were winching down a small power boat, a little rubber raft kind of thing, got it in the water, started up the motor. By this time, by the time we got stopped, we must have been a quarter mile away from where I threw that thing off the boat. And we timed it, and I've forgotten exactly, it was somewhere like eight or ten minutes before they got that boat stopped, got the rescue boat down into the water, and out to the life buoy to pick it up. Fascinating experience. Man overboard. Peter was the man overboard. He was forevermore shooting his mouth off when he ought to keep quiet, saying stupid things that he didn't even know what he was saying. Now you say, oh my goodness, you're being awfully hard. No, I'm just telling you what the Bible said about this man. Always impetuous, but always sincere and earnest and dedicated. But I've discovered an interesting thing, that just because you're sincere and earnest and dedicated, if you're doing stupid things, it doesn't help. It only makes it worse. 
And that's the way he was. And maybe the reason I'm telling this to you is that I identify with this guy so much. Shooting off my mouth when I ought to keep quiet. Saying stupid things. Being determined and interested on foolishness. The man overboard. Interesting how it starts. The book of John records it in the first chapter that Jesus is introduced to, well, actually Simon. He's introduced to Simon. And right in the very first chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus gives him a nickname. It doesn't give us any reason why he does that. Andrew brings his brother Simon to him, and he says, So you're Simon. I'm going to call you Rocky. Oh, you know, you thought I was going to say Peter, didn't you? Actually, in the Aramaic, it's Cephas anyway. Peter is in the, in the Greek. So he calls him Rocky or Rock. Doesn't tell us why he did that. Apparently he could see something. Now, maybe he had known something about him in the past. After all, they all kind of grew up there around the Lake of Galilee. Uh, he probably, with his big mouth, was well known in the area. He was a dominant type of leadership guy. And Jesus says, I'm giving you a nickname. I'm going to call you Rocky. We've probably all known somebody by the name of Rocky at some point, And usually the nickname has come on for some probably similar reason. Uh, actually might even known someone by the name of Rock. Rock Hudson. Remember that name from the movies years ago? People have been called that. And Jesus gives him a nickname right there. You're going to be known as Rocky. Interesting thing happens as you look at the references to this man in the Gospels. You will find that it is only John who refers to him most, there are a few references otherwise, but mostly John refers to him as Simon Peter. Why do you suppose that the book of John is the only one that refers to him as Simon Peter? Well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke didn't know him as anything but Peter. John did. They grew up together. They fished together. And so he continually calls him Simon Peter. Interesting little study you can make. But we must get on with that. Jesus, John, his brother James, Peter, Andrew, all growing up around the area of Galilee. Their, their trade, their life experience was fishing. Out in the middle of the night, go fishing, bring it in, sell it in the morning, eat it in the day, do it again the next day. That's what they did. Jesus shows up one morning, the great catch of fish. Need to read you a little of this, Luke 5. This is kind of a fun one. Luke, the fifth chapter. Let me find it here. Calling the first disciples. One day Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw the water's edge, two boats. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. What? You don't fish in the daytime. You fish at night when the fish don't see the net. Peter's not too sure about this. Simon, it says here. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, the people are all gathered around. He has a reputation to preserve. You don't go fishing in the middle of the day. That's when you take care of your nets. He's going to look like an idiot going out and starting fishing in the middle of the day. So to make sure that everybody knows that this wasn't his idea, I imagine he says it as loud as he possibly can, he says, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will go let down the nets. 
When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that the nets began to break. So they signaled their partners on the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees. And what do you say next? Something stupid. What would you think it would say? Oh, Master, this is an amazing miracle. You must be the messenger of the Lord. No, listen to what he says. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell on his knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Always overboard. And I must move on through these. I can't take time to read them all to you. After he had been with Jesus and the disciples for well, a few months had gone by, a year or two maybe, they're beginning to catch on that something is happening here. And so Jesus asks his disciples, you remember this story, we covered it in a sermon a little while back. Jesus asked his disciples, who do, you say, who do people say that I am? And they named various other prophets. Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah. Some, but who do you say I am? And Peter is the one who says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter said something good, didn't he? Unfortunately, he, imagined, he managed to erase it in virtually the next sentence. Because Jesus says, the Son of Man is going to go up to Jerusalem and to be killed. And what does Peter say? He takes it upon himself to lecture the one that he has just said is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter, keep your mouth shut. Do you have to go overboard with everything every time? Jesus rebukes him and says, Get behind me, Satan. You do not speak the words of God. Then he, Jesus takes him up on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is another interesting one. Don't have time to read it for you. Luke 9 if you want to look it up. Takes him up on the Mount of Transfiguration, which really was just a hillside nearby. And up there, Jesus is transfigured as he is talking to special representatives, one of resurrection, Moses, the other of translation, Elijah. And Peter is so awestruck by this that he's trembling, <clears throat> so he can't stand the silence and has to open his mouth. Now you need to look this one up and read it, because Luke records it very interesting. Peter, Peter said, <clears throat> this is a great experience, what we need to do is pitch three tents here. One for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Or make three booths, however you want to uh, translate it. Did, it. did you ever wonder what in the world that meant? Number one, where was he going to get a tent? Number two, what was the point? And the interesting thing is that when Luke records it, he doesn't understand it either. He says that Peter said we ought to pitch three tents here. Then he says he didn't know what he was saying. He just can't stand the silence, so he has to shoot off his mouth about something. Did you ever know anybody like that? Was it you? Don't know what we're saying. Then there's the issue of the walking on the water. This is a fun one. Jesus sends the disciples out to cross the water at night, and he goes off into the hills to pray. And in the middle of the night, a terrible storm comes up. And these experienced seamen are struggling to stay alive in their boat. And they look up, and they see a figure, a ghost, they say, coming to them on the water. And they're terrified, absolutely terrified. Now, once again, as I've told you before, the problem in understanding this is you know the end of the story. You say, well, what were they so shook up about? It was Jesus. They didn't know that. They were still learning who he was and what he was and how he did things. And he calls out to them and says, don't be afraid, it is I. Actually, he should have said, it is me. 
which he probably did. That's just the King James translation. So King James doesn't even get it right. He, said, it, he should have said, it is me. But it translated to the, it is I. He comes, walks up toward the boat. And Peter calls out to him and he says, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come to you on the water. So what does he do? He's the man overboard. He's the one who wants to get out there and do this wild thing. And he starts walking to Jesus and he begins looking around and he begins to get terrified and he's afraid that he is going to sink. And as he's afraid he's going to sink, he does. And Jesus reaches out and takes him back to the ship and to safety. Peter, the man overboard. I've got to go through several of them in a hurry here. Paying taxes. This was an interesting one. Someone comes up to him and says, does your master pay taxes, the, the temple tax? The question was, uh, is he like the scribes, the Pharisees? Is, is, is he one of the insiders? Does he pay tax? What does Peter do? Does he ask anybody? Does he ask the Lord? He says, yeah, of course he pays taxes. And this creates a bit of a dilemma for Jesus. And it also does one of the amazing stories where he tells him to go out and catch a fish. And when you catch the fish, look in its mouth, and you will find a coin that will cover the taxes, and then you go and pay the taxes for me. Well, first question, how many fish are there out there that have a coin in their mouth? Second question is, what are your chances of catching that fish? Incredible story. Amazing. So Peter gets away with that one. Jesus helps him out. Uh, then, then there's the forgiveness issue. Jesus is saying that we should forgive people openly and freely. We talked about this a few weeks ago, too. Open and forgiveness relationship. Peter is going to show how magnanimous he is. He says, how many times should I forgive my brother? Up to seven times? Wow. He thinks that's really generous. And Jesus, as you remember we talked about, says, no, 70 times 7, 490. Which really gets to the point of it all, that forgiveness is not an act that you do seven times or 70 times seven. It is a relationship that you establish with people. It's not something you count. It's something that you do because of who you are. But Peter has to get his foot in his mouth to find out. Then we get to the foot, foot washing issue. Jesus sees disciples unwilling to help one another in time of need. And so he wants to give them an object lesson. And he girds himself with a towel and he begins to wash his feet. Now, we follow this custom even today. But it is a ceremony. It is not what Jesus really intended to teach. What he intended to teach was not just to wash people's feet, but to serve people's need. But Peter, Peter has to make an issue of it. It comes to him, his feet are dirty, they need to be washed. But he draws himself back and he says, No, Lord, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus says, If I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me in the kingdom. So Peter's going to go one or two or three better. Not only my feet, but my hands and my head. Oh, Peter, can't you just go with what Jesus says? Do you have to reinvent it for yourself every time? Do you have to come up with something, something, some way of doing something beyond what he was doing? Why can't you just take what he says? Did you ever know anybody like that? Was it you? But now we get down to the really crux of the whole matter. Jesus says to his disciples, this night, all of you will be offended on account of me. And all of you will reject me. Peter, please keep your mouth shut. 
Please just one time keep your mouth shut. Not I. I will never be offended at you if all of the rest of them forsake you. I never will. Oh, really? And so the story continues. He sees himself as so far superior to everybody else and doesn't have any idea how weak he is inside. And so they go to the garden and the soldiers come up around to arrest Jesus. And Peter pulls out a sword. And here's another interesting one for Peter. He pulls out his sword and asks, shall we strike with the sword? Why bother to ask? You already carved off his ear. What is the point of asking the question? Is it to show off how brave you are? Look, I'm the only one who is brave enough to take on the whole army. And Jesus heals the ear of the servant and says to Peter, put away your sword. You take up that sword, you're going to die with it. And so they head down to the trial. Mr. Brave Peter, who's the only one who's not going to deny, he goes to the trial. And a little servant girl comes up. Get the story. A little servant girl comes up. Mr. Brave, Mr. With my sword, take on the whole army. A little servant girl comes up and says, weren't you with him in the garden? Peter says, no, no, I, I don't even know him. Where's your sword now, big mouth? And then another of the crowd says, I, I'm sure I saw you with, no, I tell you, I don't even know him. And finally someone says, I know that you were one of his people because your speech betrays you. Your accent tells who you are. And he starts cursing and swearing and denying that he ever even knew him. And then the rooster crows. And then Jesus goes off to the cross and dies. And the last words that Peter uttered in his presence were a vicious denial three times that he ever even knew him. Peter, can't you just keep your mouth shut? Did you ever know anybody like that? Was it you? I can imagine that it was a struggle for Peter even to stay alive during that time. And then the report comes from some women who went to the tomb early in the morning that the tomb was empty and he and his friend John enter into a foot race to head for the tomb. Why do you suppose he was so eager to get to the tomb? Do you think, on the one hand, he hoped it was true? And on the other hand, he was terrified that it was? How would you like to be the one whose words ringing in the ears of the Savior at his death were a denial and know that this person was raised as the Son of God? You're really looking forward to seeing him? Pretty frightening, isn't it? And so I think with terror and with hope, he ran to the tomb. No one there. It must be true. What must that day have been like for Peter, knowing that the Son of God was loose in the world? And the last thing you had said to him was, I don't even know him. I swear I've never seen him. You want that God running around? Pretty frightening, isn't it? 
But then a series of events begin to take place with this man overboard. And I don't have time to read them to you, so I'm just going to tell them to you. There is a throwaway text in Scripture. Let me tell you where it is. You can look it up later. It's just a little throwaway text. Luke 24, verse uh, 34. Don't look it up now. I'll tell you about it. You can look it up later. It's Cleopas and his friend who have met Jesus on the way to Emmaus. And they have run back to Jerusalem. And as they come in and tell the disciples in the upper room what they have just seen, this little throwaway piece of a verse that you may have just totally ignored is incredible. The disciples said to them, The Lord is risen indeed. And then the next four words you may have forgotten. The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared unto Simon. So what is apparently the first thing that Jesus does? Does he go look up John who was faithful at the foot of the cross? No. He goes and looks up Peter who mouthed off that he didn't even know him. Apparently the first person Jesus looks up, well he saw Mary at the tomb, but the first one that he goes and finds somewhere, we don't know where, we don't know the circumstances. We don't know what was said. But the first thing that Jesus does, the Savior of the universe, is go and look up someone who just mouthed off that he didn't even know him. Did you ever feel like what you did was too great to be forgiven? You're not even in the same league. Not even close. The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared unto Simon. First thing he does is make it right with Simon. But it's not enough just to make it right one to one. Simon needs the opportunity to make it right some other places. So after a little time has gone by, he says, I'm going fishing, and the rest of them are saying, we're going to go with you. So they go out and they go fishing and early in the morning, someone appears on the shore and says, Friends, have you caught any fish? They've got a customer. Just like that, they've got a customer. They haven't even landed the boat yet. Have you caught any fish? Somebody needs breakfast. And they call back and say, No, we've been fishing all night and haven't caught any. He says, Throw your net on the other side of the boat. What? It's dumb enough to fish in the daytime. How dumb is it to think there's fish on only one side of the boat? Throw your net on the other side of the boat. Boat's not set up to handle this. It's awkward. So they say, all right. So they throw the, fish, uh, the net on the other side of the boat, and they draw this enormous number of huge fish. And Peter knows that he is in the presence of divinity. And what does he do? the man overboard. He doesn't wait for the boat to come in. He jumps into the water and he swims to the shore and there they find that Jesus has already prepared breakfast for them. And they're sitting around eating this breakfast in absolute wonderment. And Jesus takes Peter just a little bit to the side but with an earshot of everyone there. Now get this story. He says, Simon Peter, do you love me more than all the rest of these guys? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Mr. Mouth is in trouble now. Do you love me more than all the rest of these guys? They may all forsake you, but I never will. Do you love me more than all the rest of these people? And he hangs his head and he says, Lord, you know that I love you. And he says, feed my sheep. I can imagine that Peter was eager to get away from there. And he starts to go away and he pulls him back again. 
And the second time he says, Peter, do you love me more than all the rest of these? And he hangs his head and he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. And he wants to get away, but no. How many times did he deny? How many times does he make it right? And he pulls him back again. And he says, Peter, do you love me more than all the rest of them? And he hangs his head and he says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. That's not the end of the story. One on one, he makes it right, first thing. In front of the others, he makes it right three times. But now Peter goes out to preach. And as he's walking up the temple, comes up the stairs, there's a lame beggar who has been there for years. And he says, alms, alms for the poor. And Peter says, we don't have any cash to give you. But what we do have, we will give you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And the man gets up, and it's interesting to read this. You'll have to read this one. I don't have time to read it to you. He doesn't just walk. It says he was walking and leaping into the temple. So Peter and John are walking in, but this guy's coming along. Yeah, oh, oh. He hasn't been able to do that maybe since forever. He's walking and leaping into the temple. And as you can imagine, it gets some attention. And everyone starts believing in this, and so finally it gets to the place that they are arrested and they are taken where? To the courtyard. The same courtyard where Peter mouthed off that he didn't even know him. Well, this is going to be a breeze. This is going to be a piece of cake. Last time, this guy was such a coward that he was left out of his faith by a handmaiden getting before the magistrates. We'll shut him up in a hurry. This is not going to be difficult. And they bring Peter in there. And he says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom you crucified, we raise this man up to walk. So what have you done? What have you done that is too bad for Jesus to seek you out one-on-one -on -one and reestablish your relationship? What have you done that is too bad for you to be able to stand up before others and give your testimony and make it right? What have you done that is too bad that you can't go before the magistrates and declare your faith in Jesus? You can't do anything bad enough that Jesus can't find a way for you to make it right.